Okay, nagana go, meko che chis to komaki, de kots nago tine siku. My name is Michelle. I use she and her pronouns. Really happy to see everybody here today. I uh, want to start with acknowledging that we're on Blackfoot territory. And uh, in 1877, Treaty 7 was signed. So the Blackfoot Confederacy consists of the Chiniki. Blah. No, it doesn't. That is not the Blackfoot Confederacy. It is the Gainai, the Bagani, the Siksika, and then south of the border is the Blackfeet Nation. And then in 1877, um, the Stony Nakoda, as well as the Sutina, both signed on. And that was the Good Stony, um, Good Stony, Chiniki, and Bear's Paw Nations, and the Dene, of course. And I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit status, and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. So... Um, we were talking about land acknowledgements last time and I was like too pissed off about the whole Gaza issue to be like, no, I'm people don't don't get it. And it was funny. So the original place that this book club was started with, I had given them like a land acknowledgement that they haven't really properly used. And then their most recent one didn't acknowledge Treaty 7 at all. So it didn't acknowledge any of the um their accountability as well as treaty partners. Um, but at least it acknowledges they're, they're on Blackfoot territory. Yes, that's good. But uh, I was like, oh, I, I wonder what happened. And they quit telling other folks in our area about this book club. So I guess we've been cut out of their community connector. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fine. Let them figure out whatever it is they need to figure out. But um, yeah, so this book club has uh, been going since 2016, originally called uh, Chapters in Chat. So, and it was through 12 Community Safety Initiative, but they don't acknowledge it anymore. So that's okay. Um, so with that, uh, we always let Indigenous people speak first, but I see I'm the only one here today that um, identifies as Indigenous. So uh, yeah, I guess we'll we'll get started. So originally we had this um, indigenous feminism perspectives, but then everybody wanted to do the national action uh, plan into two. And then once we read the first part, we were like, this is stupid. So then we didn't. So then I just encouraged anybody who wanted to talk about an indigenous book that they've read to talk about it tonight. So I had about three different books. I was like, oh, I should read this one. I should read this one. And I never did. But what I did read was the uh, National Inquiry um, Supplementary on the Genocide, which I, I thought was probably more fitting with how I'm feeling about the Palestinian issue right now. And um, yeah, so I, I was reading it and they just acknowledged that um, Indigenous people were never consulted in the making and definition of genocide. So I've been thinking about that a lot because... Um, and it kind of shows the dehumanization of Indigenous people before even starting about a conversation about genocide. So I was just like, so literally this was based off of an idea and um, for settler colonialism, really. Like it doesn't acknowledge uh, settler colonialism at all. Uh, Kathy's joining us just now, so that's great. Um, so yeah, now we'll have at least two Indigenous voices to to draw from and uh, I love to engage you all with your uh, books that you had read and for me really enjoyed reading the uh, genocide supplementary because for me I, I needed some kind of context of what I'm seeing with with Palestine and why it is everybody's okay with it so um, just reminding myself again you know everyone's okay with it here and they're okay with it abroad because at the end of the day, they don't see us as human. They don't see us as part of the diaspora because we're not settler colonialists. Uh, basically, it was what it comes down to. So that was the book that I had read. Uh, Kathy, welcome. Uh, we had done the land acknowledgement and we were just talking about uh, the history of uh, chapters in chat. And then I talked about... Um, what we were supposed to do for this month and yeah and then so i was just telling everybody what i was reading so um if you want to tell everybody what you are reading i uh, would love that if you'd like to pass you're welcome to um i never got a chance to review the book but i wanted to talk about um 
that Chelsea Vowell's uh, Buffalo is the new Buffalo. So if um, other people want to go first, it'll give me a chance to peruse the, <laughs> at least see the chapter titles and stuff again. Hey, settle down, you two. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. Hey. Uh, do we want to go Cat Marla? I'm ready to go. I'm uh, actually going to talk about two books because I'm a keener. But <laughs> um, from Settlers Book Club last month, we read Dene author Richard Van Camp's Moccasin Square Gardens. And the group, uh, re I really love this book. Um, it's short stories um, from 2019. And he has a wide variety of topics in there. There's a couple of kind of horror ones and others that are are um, really moving and beautiful. So I would definitely recommend that. And I plan on reading more Richard Van Camp. Uh, the second book I finished just today um, is My Name is Shield Woman, A Hard Road to Healing Vision and Leadership, written by Ruth Scalplock with Jim Pritchard, which I was fortunate, fortunate enough to find at Value Village. And it, I actually realized it's signed by Ruth. So that's amazing. Um, and I was uh, especially interested in reading her autobiography because of Reclaim Awutan and what's been going on with, with that. And um, it was just really lovely to see how she came to, to start um Awutan and how much it means obviously to her in the community and the shitty thing well, she obviously doesn't talk about <laughs> what's happening in it now um it's a book from 2014 so um almost 10 years old um and it's um written with Jim Pritchard who's a white guy and he also has collected stories about Ruth from other folks which were um, also interesting to see different perspectives on, on her, because obviously with autobiographies, you're just all thinking about yourself, but it's good to hear other people and um, what they say too. They say she's amazing. And I've only had the privilege of meeting her one time. Um, and I um, am re was really thrilled to, to have that opportunity. That's it. That's cool, Kat. I actually read that book not too long ago too. And um so I've been able I've been fortunate to meet Elder Ruth a few times. And there was one time she was sitting in a room. So we were just gathered for, you know, a bit of an event and learning from elders. And she was wearing these big sunglasses and had this scarf. And I just looked at her and I thought, Ruth is the OG. <laughs> just I will never get that image out of my head it was just so great um and she's so kind and passionate about Otan which leads me to I actually did read the feminist book making space for indigenous feminism oh it like I need a course in this because there was so much in that book um it just it took me a long time to read and usually I'm a pretty quick reader but I was trying to absorb as much as I could and I know I missed probably half of it still um but really good perspectives and um I the book's downstairs and I broke my leg so I can't go get it so that's why I'm in bed it's a little hard for me to move around so but I made some notes so I'll do the best I can to try I wanted to refer to the book um, but one thing I definitely learned was, uh, of course, I know the Indian Act is racist, but I didn't realize the revisions that were made around um, women regaining status still is problematic. So that was a major uh, learning for me. And, um, and it's still before the courts, I think, like this book was from 2017. And I tried Googling one of the cases. Um, I believe it's Brenda McIver, her last name from McIver. I'm just forgetting her first name. Uh, that was just getting ready to go before the courts again to try and um, fix some of that. 
So I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't changed, but I don't know if anyone has any background on that. I can tell you that it hasn't changed enough. Um, okay. I know I, I was just going to Google it to make sure it's S3. Um, it was a senator's bill that went through and um, Murray Sinclair told me to get Sam's uh, Indian status from because of it, because it's supposed to help eliminate some of those inequities. Mm. However, um, you know, we've already gone through the uh, Indian affairs once and they never gave us a proper reason as to why it is like we'd like what documents that they needed. Like what I what I suspect, because there's zero accountability in Indian affairs, is that they got all of the, the documents and they went uh, check, check, check on a piece of paper, lost that piece of paper, sent me back my documents. And then like six months later went, oh, we didn't have enough documents and and rejected it. So, or no, I had three months to appeal, but it was in the middle of, this was two years ago when we had that uh, issue with moving from Lethbridge back to Calgary. So I was like, I do not have fucking time for this. So anyway, we resubmitted uh, just like a month before Sam turned 16. We haven't heard anything from them. Um, so I don't know how much longer it'll be, but like people who have their status, um, it's still like 11 months to get your new card. Right. Like there's no accountability at Indian Affairs whatsoever and they can reject you over a stupid reason. Then you can reapply. And then like it, it's like uh, and I've heard similar things about H where it's like you have to reapply, 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 reapply in order to get it. And it doesn't make any sense as to why they rejected it all those other times. So that's where we're at. Like so Samantha, this if they do give it to her. Um, under the Indian Act, under S3, um, it doesn't sound like her offspring will be able to get it. Right. So that was actually a major conversation during the AFN was that um, which chief would, you know, change the registration, right? Because we're, we're actually at the point exactly what was intended back in 1876. We're at the point right now, a tipping point where, yeah, we may have like 3000 people living on a reserve but only a small handful of them are registered and none of the kids and grad kids are right. So um, by rights, oh, well, by Canadian settler colonial rights and their colonial ways, they can just apprehend the land and be like, Oh no, sorry guys, you can't, um, this isn't yours. Cause your, your band is extinct. Even though there's thousands of people on the reserve, they just don't want to recognize the kids and the grandkids. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, more than interesting. <laughs> Disgusting, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some some other things I pulled out of that book too. Um, so there was one um contributor who's from Australia originally, um, although she's teaching here in, in Canada, and then also a Mexican um indigenous woman. And uh you know, there's a comment in there that from outside, Canada is seen as a better place for Indigenous women. And I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> how bad is it elsewhere? Like, it's horrendous here. It's hard to imagine. Um, so that just stuck in my mind. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, comments generally about the challenge of ad advancing uh, feminism in some indigenous communities and and um, how hard it is for for women to be able to make those advancements um, so that made me want to go to the OG and ask her what she thinks about feminism in her community <laughs> so um, one day I will see her again and I will ask her that uh, and then something in my day-to-day -day work. So we work with um, seniors and elders and we talk a lot about social determinants of health. And so there's a chapter on that about how um, they do not address um, colonialism at all uh, as a factor. Um, so that's stuck with me too. Um, and that was actually a Métis woman, uh, Deidre Desmarais and um, I'm, I know uh, Métis, she wouldn't say her she's an elder. I would think of her as one with all that she's taught me 
Um, but it really made me think of her and, and the work that she's been doing over the years. And then there was a comment about the MMIWG report and how the term male violence is not included. And that made me go Google it because I couldn't remember. And there's one reference to it, but it was saying that um, male violence isn't the term to use because that's too narrow when you're talking about the scope of the issues. And so that's left me pondering. <laughs> hmm. That's that's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what I think about that. Well, I think, uh, um, and I'll, I'm going to try to put it in this this framework for you from my perspective. Yeah. Obviously, Kathy has has hers. Um, racism was imposed, right, uh, with settler colonialism. So our men was they were taught this hate and violence against women, this misogyny. So to us, the root problem is colonialism, not our men. Right. And like the media and Canadians like to say it's men, but it's not. And even statistically, that proves it. The biggest violence that we have is colonial trauma from colonial violence. And so, like, if really, if we're going to address the root cause of the issue, it's colonialism. But nobody wants to do that. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, yeah, those are all the notes I have on my phone, but, um, it's a great, it's a really engrossing read. If you have the time, any of you, thanks for the recommendation, Michelle. Um, it's definitely a keeper. And, right on. uh, on the fun side, one of my first, um, really fun books I read, uh, was Sherry, uh, Dimeline's, um, Empire of Wild. It was like kind of my first foray into you know mysticism and I thought this isn't normally my kind of book I don't know what I'm gonna think and I just fell in love and now I read all sorts of books like that but she was the start and um I got to see her there's a word fest event recently hex the patriarchy and she was one of the authors and it was so <laughs> awesome to see her live uh, but that's another good, good recommendation for a bit of a fun read. Nice. This is great. Okay. So I just came up with two minutes. I'm going to take two minutes of everybody's time here and, uh, let me know if you can hear it or if there's a problem. Government Indian propaganda. Status in Canada is governed by the Indian Act. It defines how a person is entitled to be registered. Registered persons are eligible for rights, services, and benefits. Historically, sex-based criteria in the Indian Act caused long-lasting inequities. Canada made changes to the Act in 1985 and 2011 to remove a number of sex-based inequities. Following engagement with First Nations, further changes were made to the Indian Act in 2017 and 2019 under S3. These legislative changes addressed outstanding sex-based inequities in registration. S3 extends entitlement to descendants of women impacted by sex-based discrimination dating back to 1869. This entitles generations of First Nations people to Indian status. These changes could mean that you or someone you know may be entitled to registration. To know if you are entitled to registration, ask yourself. Did my mother, grandmother, or great-grandmother lose status due to marriage to a non-entitled man before April 17, 1985? Being born outside of marriage between an entitled father and non-entitled mother between September 4, 1951 and April 16, 1985? Did one of my parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents lose status because of their mother's marriage to a non-entitled man before April 17, 1985? Have their name removed from the Indian Register or from a banned list because their father was not entitled to status? To find out if you are entitled to register... So like that legitimately doesn't fix a damn thing of the whole um, issue that we were facing at all. Like... I... I... <laughs> I, I think if Darcy looked back hard enough at his own family, 
he could maybe find one of his grandmas who because he had a grandma who went to boarding school in the states and um or I, I should say a great grandmother that went and uh we've I haven't been able to find her um you know record of which school she went to but we know that that is the case because the grandmother and like that generation nobody went to school because they could hide enough not to go so they were all illiterate so darcy's grandmother that passed away she actually didn't know how to read um as a result of the violence the family faced so anyway they have non-status like so that's why i always rec recognize status and non-status because there's so many non-status that are are here uh, i have friends that are visibly native but they're non-status right and they think they must be metis with that i i can already feel jason uh, chelsea vowel just had an aneurysm me saying those words out loud so anyway with that <laughs> i'm going to um, pa um pause it for our friend i'm mostly ready okay hi everybody um glad to be here um the book I'm covering is Chelsea Vowell's uh, Buffalo is the New Buffalo. Um, it was written in 2022. It's really good. It's um, eight short stories that are all kind of in interconnected in their own ways. There's one or two that stand alone, but um, mostly there's parts that all interconnect. Um, Chelsea Vowell is Métis. Uh, she's from Lac St. Anne. She lives in Edmonton. Um, yeah, so she does a lot of work. She teaches Cree language. She has a podcast called Métis in Space. Um, and she's, she's just a very busy woman. She has a lot of things on the go. But I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Um, you know, I was just picking it up, thinking short stories. It's it's easy. You can read them and be done. You can put the book down for however long. And but they're all kind of interconnect, interconnected. So it, it didn't quite work the way I thought it would. But I really love the book. Um, so what at the introduction here, there are little um, blurbs about each paragraph uh, or each short story. So I will just quickly read read it and then see if I can remember anything about the chapter because it's been a few months since I read the book. Okay, so the first story is called Buffalo Bird. And um, Buffalo Bird is set in the middle to late 19th century before Canada violently colonized the plains. Um, following the li life of Angelique Lawyer, a two-spirit Rougarou shapeshifter, as she tries to solve a murder in her community and later joins the resistance against Canada. This story imagines the Iron Confederacy, a political alliance between Cree, Salto, Nakoda, and Métis, having successfully stopped Canadian expansion into the West. So I, I really enjoyed the whole idea that colonization never occurred. Um, and I just like the fact that, you know, she was... She, she turned into a horse. So it was just like she could shape shift like her grandmother into a horse and she stomples a person that was trying to kill her or something. So it was like, yes. <laughs> Kathy, the um, timing the of that, I, I just want to interrupt real quick because of the the uh, the connection of today is that uh, CRNRL had uh, one of the railway lines had a indigenous community uh committee and they all unanimously like um resigned so oh <laughs> I, I just think it coincidentally ties into what you're saying in a, in a really fun cute way <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh pretty cool uh, so the second story is called mitchiff man and um and i found that story it's like this is a story about a metis superhero frankie callaloo who, Kalahu, who is gored by a radioactive bison and granted super strength. However, he is also pl plagued by the distortion, which causes everyone except those related to him by blood to immediately forget about him. Years later in the 21st century, Indigenous scholars push back against the notion that Mitchiff Man was simply a folk myth and present evidence that Frankie Kalahu actually actually existed 
and served his community in a in a variety of ways. So I really like that because once he gets over the initial shock of like he'd order and then the waitress would come back 10 minutes later and want to take his order again. Like he would never get served at restaurants or anything. And because they would forget as soon as they walk away, they forget him, any interaction they had with him. So then he also starts doing some crimes and then he decides that he can also do things for good. Um, but you know, it's like, it's a pretty cool superpower to have because yeah, you could you could do all the crime you want because people would forget that you did it. <laughs> so it's kind of like, hmm, but then he decides to be good and and help people once he figures out that his own family can interact with him and they remember. So he starts helping and that was it was a good story. Um Dirty Wings is a th third story and it's um mm. Yeah, I can't remember anything about that. So I'm just going to skip Dirty Wings because it just doesn't ring a bell. Um, the fourth story, Maggie Sue. I really enjoyed that because it takes place in Edmonton. Um, this native girl comes off of a bus or something or he's this guy sees a native woman. Yeah, he's he's walking out of a pizza joint and and he sees this beautiful native woman and he starts following her asked her her name and he thought she, he thought she said Maggie Sue so he's he's that's the name of like Maggie Sue but it's actually Maggie Sue is a Cree word for fox so she's telling him that she's a fox so she's shapeshift into human form but she goes to the Ikea in Edmonton and then all these buffalo come out of a big painting 600 buffalo come charging out of this huge mural that's in the Ikea in Edmonton apparently and um, it's it's just a great story. I really liked it. Um, and it and it's and it goes on again. Like it, some of them inter interact with different chapters. Um, the next chapter is a, a lodge within her mind. Now this is really good because it, this young girl is so bored from the pandemic that she strolls along and there's this um she what she thinks is an ad for virtual reality and so she signs up without reading the 100 pages of um stuff you know before you sign she signs up and she gets sent this thing to put over her head and she thinks that it's just going to take her reality of all the things she knows and create so that she can maybe go out and play in the park or whatever you know go for a walk outside but it ends up that she signed up to have her consciousness downloaded, copied and downloaded into this into um, this machine and Internet, basically. So her consciousness is now downloaded and she doesn't really understand what she did um, and she tries to get out of it. Uh, so then the next chapter and I can't even say the word it's a, it's an go Oh. It can or something like that. But it's um it's about basically Metis anti-technology strummy demonstrating how we will continue to innovate without compromising our self-determination. That's they're using nano nanotechnology so that from birth the kids will only speak Cree or their native language. And, and it's Cree, I think, for this one. Um so I really like that. Um the idea that everybody would would be able to speak Cree like just like that. You're, you're born knowing Cree. I just thought, whoa. <laughs> and then I Bison is the next short story. And and I'm probably missing where it starts, but there's a the young girl Angie is the one that downloaded her her um consciousness. So now she passes away because she's kind of crazy and kind of living on the streets and all that stuff and she she ends up dying but her cousin who was hanging with her a lot is now tasked with finding her consciousness because her mother doesn't believe that she can go to the afterlife if her consciousness is being held in this laboratory right so her cousin which I can't remember her name is sneaks in not sneaks in but she goes to the lab to talk to the the director and gets permission to go into the mainframe where 
Angie's consciousness is being held. And Angie is a buffalo in this one. So so she's talking to her and she's in the shape of a buffalo. So it's, um, I don't know, it's just like all the stories were like so different and so cool. And then the final story is called Unsettled. And it's to solve the global energy crisis, a technique is developed to induce deep hibernation in humans with small teams rotating to ensure critical infrastructure continues running. A group of indigenous youth who have volunteered to work one such shift ponder the implications of having the op opportunity to rid Turtle Island of settler colonizers. Will settler anxiety be validated? Will the op oppressed do the do to do onto the colonizer as has been done to them? So that's that was kind of cool, like um, you know, just getting into the story and realizing that what they're doing is they're making all of the, the poor people do all the grunt work of watching the machineries to make sure they don't break down. So they have to keep a small percentage of the population awake so that the rich people can sleep for like, I don't know how 300, 500 years so that the world has time to heal and the energy, you know, like, so all the rich people just want to sleep, have the grunts do the work. And, and then, so the, it's this group of indigenous people. And there's one has this idea that they're going to, turn the power off and kill all the sleeping colonizers. And it's kind of like, <laughs> so it, it's a good book. I've really enjoyed each and every story in there. Um, it, it, it made me think a lot more than I thought it would. I was just expecting short stories that would just be like fluff stuff, you know, but um, oh yes. And the other thing I really liked is in, in unsettled, there's a person that uses the pronouns we are, which was really hard to get used to when you were reading it because we are is non-gendered and it has and it and it can and if I recall it, it can be referred to more than one person. So it's just to say we all the time. I found it really I kept kept rereading what I was reading because I wasn't getting it at first. So I really enjoyed that. And I was like, I should start using we <laughs> as my pronouns. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have to say. It's a good book. Everybody should grab a copy. And I don't know if it's at the library or not, but it's a really good book. <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome. Anybody want to uh, respond to that book before we move on? It's at the library. I've already put it on hold. <laughs> uh, hang on. It's good. It's really worth it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Right on. Wendy, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Thanks. And uh, and thanks, Kathy, for sharing enough details to get us all excited about the stories. They sounded wonderful and distinct. Um, I, I read a book that actually connects to some of the bits that uh, Marla and Michelle, you were just talking about a few minutes ago. So uh, from our from our last book club and from reading the um, all the reports that we've read, uh, we've talked a little bit about masculinity, but I found one that was called uh, Men, Masculinity and the Indian Act. Um, and it was written by uh, a man from the Oneida Nation, um, Martin J. Cannon, and it is uh, it has so much detail, but it's very readable. Um, and as you can see, it's not it's not too big, uh, but has some really uh, jam packed chapters with a lot of um, a lot of the complexity and the nuance. So it gives a lot of examples over time since the beginning of the Indian Act, and really emphasizes how interlocking the um, issues of racism and sexism are. So it talks a lot about um, how that hasn't really been addressed in various legal cases and how Canada um, doesn't seem to have the capacity to address um, both things at the same time, that you can be an Indigenous person and also a woman, and, and those pieces are there. 
Um, but was really glad that you were talking about S3 and uh, thank you for showing that little video um, because he also emphasizes what those cases looked like um, when they were trying to make those amendments um, and then emphasizes how it actually hasn't resolved anything. Um, so talks quite a, a lot about that. Um, and I'm just going to go back to my note. I took pages and pages of notes. Like he just had endless things that I wanted to, to write down and to quote, um, but really helped me to go a little further into understanding, um, I guess just all the damage that the Indian Act did and continues to do. Um, and so talked about, um, I'm just going to grab a couple things that I wrote down um, because they really stuck with me. Um, one of them, so this is a part where they were talking, he was talking about how it was enforcing patriarchal relations. Um, and so this one in particular says there's resentment over the loss of uh, status and rights, but would be directed uh, toward not toward the Indian Act, but towards status Indians. So talked quite a lot about how instead of pushing back on Canada and the decisions in the Indian Act, it actually created a lot of um, not good situations within Indigenous communities. Um, it talked a lot about uh, women, um, so white settler women who then gained status uh, through marriage. Um, and then uh, Indigenous women who uh, were not able to keep status. Um, and then, I mean, there's endless cases that he cites um, and, and kind of unpacks how it went and, and what the limitations were of that. So um, I think near the end, when he was... Um, summarizing all the details so each of the chapters goes chronological through time um so the uh part where he arrived at sorry um i really like some of the comments he made in the conclusions because tries not only to emphasize where this is problematic but also some of the um multi-layered things that have to happen for this to be addressed so that yes all these legal issues need to keep happening and keep being pushed on but also there's lots of work within communities and lots of work for for settlers as well but uh it does focus on um really recentering um indigenous government governance and indigenous knowledge um does make reference to undrip um and kind of gives specific parts of undrip that uh, highlight why this continues to be problematic. Um, and then I, I liked that he was highlighting, um, right, I still find it complex to understand the, um, the idea that, that Canada is making decisions about who's part of what, you know, like it's, it's a really hard thing to wrap my head around. Um, but I liked this quote in helping me understand that. Um, it said, discussions about band membership draw our attention away from the fact that it should be nationhood, not Indianness, that defines our relationship with one another and with Canada. So really ties back to being sovereign nations. And that was the in intent of where we should have been going. Um, and, and that helped me a lot because I think it, on its face, as I start to learn about um, the Indian Act, um, some of these deeper comments help me understand um, why it, it will never actually address the, the issues that are there. So really uh, appreciated reading that book. I was a little intimidated when I got it. I was afraid it was going to be way too legal for me, um, but I found it very approachable and um, really helped me go a little further in my understanding of the, of the Indian Act. That's amazing. Does he make any references at all to the National Inquiry? Um, well, this was 2019. So he, I mean, he, he has, he has some, oh, he, he, he referenced everything. Like there's, there's like 30 different pages of, of reference supports to this. I, I think, um, there are, 
he didn't seem to miss anything. I didn't pull out specific references to the inquiry in the notes that I had made, um, but he has really been thorough in all the different, um, I, I'm trying to remember what year it was that the inquiry came out. 2019. 2019. Yeah. Okay. So like it, it would have been probably written at the same time that was going on. And honestly, I wonder if like, and just me thinking out loud, I'm wondering if it was like his attempt at testimony without testifying, you know what I mean? Because yeah. like, um, when, when both the TRC and the national inquiry were going through, like I had so many feelings every single day, something new would be resurfaced. And in a way I regret not journaling it because like that is our own healing right and i i kind of i don't know if missed opportunity but you know just having reflections i i wish i would have done that more um so anyway him with his perspective obviously you know an incredible inspect uh you know perspective of of what he sees so uh it almost sounds like it should be a supplementary anyway to the inquiry either or you have you have said it that I actually, I, this is going on my Amazon wish list. <laughs> Not that anybody should buy from Amazon today out of all days, but boycott. <laughs> I, I think you're probably onto something with that, Michelle, because he talks about his own family and that they were kind of a lineage of matriarchs and, and his own unpacking of that was necessary for him to write this and and to do this work so you're probably right on with him doing that as a process himself incredible yeah, yeah no it sounds like an, an a book i must read actually so thank you for that thank you all for all of your contributions does anybody want to reflect on anything that anybody else said Okay, in the comments, I have uh, the next book list coming up as well as the Zoom. So for folks who um, aren't in my book club that are listening, it's uh, Lessons in Legitimacy by Sean Carlton. I talked to him yesterday and he has confirmed he's going to come and talk to it. So, um, you know, save your questions if you have them, make them. Um, I hope that you can all read it over Christmas holidays. That's it. This is a tough book to read over Christmas holidays. So anyway, having the author talk will be great. He asked me if he if uh, we should do he should do a presentation. I said, no, that's OK. Uh, you don't have to do that. It'll probably be more of a QA. and a So I just, you know, obviously encourage people to think of questions that you'd like to ask them. Um, February 12th, Disarm, Disfund, Dismantle, uh, Police Abolition in Canada. March 11th, Canada as a settler colony on the question of Palestine. Uh, April 8th, Indigenous Women in Street Gangs. Uh, the narratives of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people. It said Indigenous Women in Gangs, and two names look male, so I hope I'm wrong. Anyway, May 13th. Uh, doing things the right way, Dene tradition justice. Uh, th this was actually um, brought up by Rosemary, who I hope we're, uh, is doing well. She's been in my prayers. Uh, by Joan Ryan. It's I I have this book and I've been meaning to read it. So when she said it, I'm like, thank God. So maybe we can do something that is actually of my people. Um, Two Spirit. For, oh, sorry, June 10th. Two Spirit stories, sex and ceremony behind it all by Alicia Two Bears. Uh, July 8th, Truth Telling by Michelle Good. August 12th, Killing the Wittigo, Indigenous Cultural Based Approaches to Waking Up, Taking Action, and Doing the Work of Healing uh, by Suza Suzanne Mathot. Uh, Unbroken by Angela Stewart is our um, September 9th, October 14th, Moon of the Turning Leaves by, Wabinish by Wab Rice. Uh, November 11th, I thought, and unfortunately it's US based, but so I was gifted this book, so I really want to read it. And it's Code Talker by Chester Nez. And then on December 9th, Reflections on Allyship by Andrea Menard. And then I have the Zoom link for anybody who wants to message me. And uh, I just wanted to ask the, the crew here too, like obviously you talked about your books that you read over the last month. Um, and I know I 
disparage the national action plan so badly. But I want to ask you some of your favorite books that we read over the course of the year. And uh, yeah, go from there. So maybe I'll just ask uh, Kat, Kathy, Marla, our friend, and then Wendy, and then I'll, I'll reflect on on some of mine too. You put me on the spot because <laughs> I don't remember every single book we've read. I think they I've gotten something out of every single book. Um, and I really appreciate your perspective and Kathy's perspective and the rest of the group to bring up things that uh, I never think about or haven't thought about. So um, I, I'm just looking over here at my bookshelf. So um, ooh, I don't I can't remember it. Peace and Good Order was a really great one. Yeah. Anyway, um, I did have a question about this Zoom link. Is that a new Zoom link? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will. I, I'll get it. I don't, to Rose sure. Rose. I don't know if I could repeat like this one again. So, um, yeah. So that's that's the one. And then I figured too, it would give a chance for people to engage if they so chose to, um, just in case. Sometimes I give it out to people and then they never show up and I don't know if they are have nefarious. I, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, Kathy, do you want to talk about some of your favorite books that you read over the course of the year? I don't mean to put everybody on the spot. It's okay. I just came down here to take a look. Like I love the Jesse Wente. The, um, I mean, we did two of them. We did Unreconciled this year and From the Ashes. Was that the year before or do I have it mixed up? Like they were, and then we also Scars and Stars. So that was a good one too. Um, <laughs> like Jesse Wente was just awesome. Or uh, Jesse Thistle is From the Ashes. I really like that one too. Yeah, um, I really like those two as well. Yeah. Now, which was that book that had the whole chapter in Cree that if you wanted to finish the book, you'd have to work on it? <laughs> was that mm. a book I just read by myself? Or was that Joshua Whitehead, Making Love with the Land? It might have been. I don't know if I read it, though. Same with the stars where, and scars. I don't think yeah, I Yeah, we're the one. last chapter, and I, I never did finish it, but I, I really liked that idea of making you work to read a story. <laughs> You know, get your old Cree dictionary out and and uh, work on it. So I can't remember what book that was, though. Maybe Billy but, um, Belcourt. Anyway, mm, yeah. I don't think we did that one, did we? In, in oh, we club? didn't. No, but I know you read beyond the book club, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, And I'm just uh, kind of like going through Indigenous women and in Indigenous Women and Street Gangs. I've had that book for a while, but I haven't read it yet. So Same. That's exactly what happened with me. Exactly. I'm like, I have this book. I need to read it. So now it's part of our book club. Okay. Um, but I did notice I do have that one that, that um, oh my God, I can't remember the name now, but that Men, Masculinity and the Indian Act. I have that one, but I also have another book that looks interesting and I've never read it yet, but it's Indigenous Men and Masculinities, and it's um, edited by Alexander in uh, Ennis and Kim Anderson, and it's like a bunch of short stories by, not short stories, but a bunch of essays by various people, and I was just looking through it, and it, it looks like it's a good read, so now I'm like, okay, I guess I should read about the men, too, because I haven't read anything about the men. <laughs> Yeah, maybe um, that's why I like Jesse Thistle's and Jesse uh, Wente's book so much is because it does give male perspective. But ironically, I identified most with those books out of all the ones we've read because they um, were urban natives, right? Yeah. And I, I just think their urban native experience is so different than uh, those who grew up on res or um, uh, maybe, I don't know, they're both straight and cis. Maybe that's part of it, too. I relate to that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the one book that I really I found really touched me a lot which was surprising was that Mind Spread Out on the Ground by Alicia Alicia something like I believe that's her name I can't see it in my bookshelf but oh that one really was good um, 
and it was just a story if I recall but it just um I could relate to it so much you know there were so many books like that um standoff you know like with by Bruce McIver that was a really good book um yeah yeah there was some good yeah. books I'm glad that there were some ones that everybody remembered enough to like them um yeah. sometimes that we read some books and they're just almost painful like I still haven't finished reading Clearing the Plains and that was like book three in like 2016 because it was just so painful like so painful reading it and uh yeah I know it it's it just it's heart-wrenching and that's it's more academic Alicia Elliott I think yeah. spread yeah. mine spread out Mine's on the ground yeah, yeah that thanks was to our friend awesome in the comment book. yeah yeah, but yeah, if anybody wants to borrow Clearing the Plains, I actually found a hard copy at, at Fair's Fair, so I can borrow out the, my soft hot copy of it if anybody wants to read it. It's a hard one to get through, but it's very informative, and um, I think everybody should read it if they really want to know what happened to the Indigenous people. It just spells it out so plainly. Like <laughs> I think every yeah. Canadian should be forced to read that book. And I, I, I believe that too. Um, yeah. 21 things of the Indian act is a good one, but it's like, it's like kindergarten. Yeah. Like clearing the planes is like taking the TRC and hitting you in the head with it for two days. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's just, um, it makes you understand things. I think that's when I finally started talking back to people with, when they would say sex or not sexist but racist things that's when I finally start standing up and saying well you know what you did to our people or my people and like that's we're we're traumatized that's why we we drink that's why we drug it's if you were treated the same way for the past 500 years that you've treated us you would be doing that you know and you, you know what we wouldn't be standing there putting you down we'd be giving you a helping hand because that's the way we are you know, like I, I never used to say anything like that. I might think it, but I'd never say it. But after reading James Daschuk, it was like really put things in, into perspective so that I could actually, I just couldn't sit there and listen anymore to people and, and saying they're racist shit anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think we are, we should be proud of who we are because we thanks to our ancestors are here somehow we're here when every possible barrier and policy meant to eliminate us was put in front of our ancestors and yet here we are so yep yeah you know we, you know when you think about how the, they say you know we were supposed to work like the the farmers that colonizers but Every time we try to get ahead, they would make some law to put us down so that we couldn't compete with them because they didn't want us to compete. You know, like um, they'd be like, oh, they got unfair advantage because they're like communists. They work together. Well, fuck you. If we want to help each other, that's our fucking way. So go to hell, you know, like it's just like. But of course, that's that's all they had to say back then. Oh, they're like communists. And the government said, OK, let's make some laws so that they can't compete fairly. Right. You know, it just that's in uh, Lost Harvest. Right. With, you know, like where they talk about the Peasant Farming Act and shit like that. Right. Yeah. And not seeing the irony of all the Mormons or the Hutterites that do the exact same thing of working together, but they weren't demonized like our people were yeah yep all right mm -hmm. um anybody else want to reflect on some of their favorite books uh marla our friend and wendy yeah i think i i actually really um i enjoyed going through the mmiwg report with everybody because i think it warranted discussion and had i read it just on my own i wouldn't have absorbed as much as I did so I really um appreciate that you brought that forward Michelle uh I want to say generally thank you for helping me on my journey this year I think these have been really great opportunities to learn and reflect and and talk about um 
all these issues <laughs> that sometimes it's hard to find an audience to speak with. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, I also really liked the true spirit and original intent of Treaty 7. Mm. I mean, that was a thick book. <laughs> yeah. But I love me some nonfiction. But I really like how they how they put all the Indigenous voices first, like you do here, right? Um, yeah, that that book really stuck with me, actually. A lot of things that were that were said in that book. And you just don't encounter um that level of like that volume of reflection and and um history mm -hmm. uh indigenous history right in together in one book so I, I really really enjoyed that one um and um that's great Kathy I was gonna say Alicia Elliott has a new book out so I don't know what it's called, but you might want to look for it if you enjoyed her her other one. Yes, I, I'll have to. Yeah. Because I really liked it. <laughs> so many books. I just get lost sometimes. And I, I have so many I haven't read. It's like it's my my addictive personality it's I have to have enough that I haven't read so I know I'll be happy for a long time <laughs> <laughs> you gotta just you know give a little tweak here and now and then and get another book read <laughs> right on you know um Dar so Samantha she's in grade 11 and um there's this author now he is problematic apparently he's a sexual harasser but uh and and that's been documented if you if you google it but it's um uh the stories of a part-time indian by alexa sherman or sherman alexia i can't remember either or um she they're, they're doing the audio in school and they're they're listening to it and but sam's the only indigenous person in, i think it's in social studies or english i can't remember so she's sitting there cracking up and laughing and thinking parts are hysterically funny, but she has nobody to laugh with. So I was going to try to power through this book just so that I can, because I have it. It was one of those books that were gifted to me for free. So I was going to power through it just so that she'd have somebody to laugh with. But um, she recently seen smoke signals. And so uh, she says, it sounds like Thomas. Thomas is talking the whole time. He sounds just like Thomas. I'm like, well, I think it'd be worth reading just knowing that's the voice that I would be hearing in my head as I read it. Yep, that's the book. Yeah, so all the grade 11 students at Jack James are listening to that book. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read it, Kathy? No, I haven't. Um, Maybe you just... and I should try to do it, like power through over the holidays or something. But I, it's just that I got this book and I want to make sure I ask some really thoughtful questions to Sean. I was going to try to look through some of those, you know, how people do Q and A's on CBC or something. And like, I don't want to ask him the same questions that have already been asked of him. So yeah, those are, that's my only hesitation, but yeah, I want to power through it real quick because uh, Sam's really enjoying it. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I'll pull it up and see how I do with it. <laughs> sure. Uh, the 26th is the next uh, fire if you want to pop over. Okay. Yeah, Sounds it's good. Boxing Day. It's tough. If you got other plans, I'll understand. So. Yeah, no, yeah. I uh, just make my war wonton soup for Christmas. That's all I usually do. <laughs> that sounds yummy to me. So, okay, I'm going to pause it for a moment for a friend. I guess it's my turn to go. Um, so I I agree with many of what others have said. I mean, I can't even remember what month it was when we uh, talked about Jesse Wente's book, but um, also him coming and talking. Like, I remember just not wanting that Zoom call to end. Like, it was just a really great experience. So I appreciated that a lot. Um, peace and good order uh, you know I continue to be pleasantly surprised by you know thinking about legal things um in very readable ways but talking with this group but I think it I would echo what others have said uh reading the MMIW reports together 
Um, you know, a, a couple things to add to that. I think um, talking about them together was really helpful. And then I found myself bringing it up in different ways, mm -hmm. in different moments. Um, and the fact that we had a conversation together made it easier for me to process it and have it in my mind um, in various conversations. Um, and, and people have been receiving that quite well in the sense that they have not read the reports, but then getting to talk to them. You know, I think looking at that report that we read last month that we found quite challenging and, and lacking in various ways, having read all the work that went in to the MMIW reports, um, and then reading that after the TRC, it just, um, I think people miss out on what those, how rich those are, Mm -hmm. um, when they think about the word report, um, because they don't really read like a report. They read more like a book, uh, more like uh, stories that need to be told. Yeah. Um, and so just have really appreciated both the book club conversations, but also the way we talked about it just made it more possible to talk about it in general. Mm -hmm. um, and just, uh, you know, I think the the closest I've come to talking to people who, who aren't in a book club right now who have been reading those, they do often go to the calls to justice. So they'll go and they will have read that part. Yeah. Um, so that is that is a really good opening. But I think, um, yeah, just thank you for taking the time and for, for putting it in front of us to read it together. Um, because I think it's just making me want to read more of those things together with people um and uh and make it worth the time i think nobody feels like they have the time but once you start reading them like they are so much better than any other report um that that has been produced and we we should take the they took the time to write it <laughs> we should take the time to read it well and and especially in in the case of the national inquiry like you know how many elections have it has it been an issue since 2015 right and i like I, and I just want to say conversely, I'm just grateful to have other people to talk to about it because otherwise I'd be reading them alone, and that's no fun um, under the best of circumstances. But like as you all know, it's really hard to process. And then after reading that, reading like such an awful report like the National Action Plan, you know, it it uh, it just gives that context. And I always hope too that bigger picture that people will see that if. Um, everyone all qt bipoc read the national inquiry like this helps all of the gay community it helps all of the different colors of the the rainbow in general it helps um bipoc people right like it, it it's so strongly anti-racist but yeah, there's so many canadians that don't understand that and then conversely for white people if they were to read it they would say oh, holy cow there's a whole culture and a uh, lack of understanding on misogyny that I had no concept of, right? So like it would it would enrich the feminist movement and the white women and and the and the men who are like, oh, like misogyny exists, no way, right? Because there's so many people still like that. Um, but I'm just grateful I had you all to read it with, frankly. Um, I have two developments to tell you that's kind of been happening behind the scenes today. Um, one of our uh, reconciliation ac action group people brought up with the group um, something that is news today, and it's that uh, there's like 30 pieces that the RCMP want to dispose of from Robert Picton's farm. Just dispose of it, not give it back to families or have ceremony or nothing. Just they and they're really callous about it too. They're like, well, we can't store it forever just total dicks about it. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that is happening, I'm waiting for a link to come to me. Um, and I'll probably be doing some interviews tomorrow. Um, the Calgary police service have, uh, found a person an indigenous liaison to focus just on, uh, missing persons cases, only they're non-indigenous. So those are the two developments that have happened over the last 24 hours that I'm sitting here shaking my head. And that's not including yesterday at the Palestinian um, rally afterwards, uh, everybody was going home and there was a homeless person who looks indigenous and uh, 
the police were very aggressive with him and somebody was videotaping and they were asking, uh, what's that scarf you're wearing? Because they thought it was one of these Palestinian ones. So it was like anti-Indigenous, uh, anti like Islamophobic, um, oppressive, and it's all on video. It's going around the internets. And um, yeah, and now they've hired somebody who's non-Indigenous to work on Indigenous cases, cold cases. So that's going well. Um, for those who don't know, I, I had an interaction on the uh, Twitter with one of the police um, main guys, and uh, they had an anti-racism committee meeting. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I wasn't invited. So I asked if there was any Indigenous representation, because in the picture, there clearly was not. And uh, they said, oh, yes, we had our uh, Indigenous liaison team there. And so I was actually messaging another friend of mine. And he said that, oh, yeah, well, but they they were there for three and a half hours and then had to go. And so I was like, OK, well, uh, thank you. And in my head, I knew, I guess, my time with their Indigenous Advisory Committee is done because we haven't met in a year and they didn't invite me to these meetings. So I uh, updated my LinkedIn to show like last year around this time was the last time we ever had any conversation as a as a committee. So whoever they hired, I guess, is now their Indigenous committee. So which is fine, like absolutely. But as you all know, there's that oppression dynamic. So that the moment you say no, some moment you get fired. So we'll see how long they last and how well they do. And how this non-Indigenous person does with uh, such a major file. <sighs> Here we are. Yeah, the, the Calgary police said that uh, they can't discriminate based off of race. So, like, you can discriminate based off of not knowing French if it's a, you know, position that needs French and English, but not in this case of Indigenous, right? So, again, it's that dehumanizing Indigenous people. So... Yeah, this is where we're at, folks. After reading that national inquiry, going through it so thoroughly together, this is, it is 2023, 20, about to be 2024, um, you know, five years post the report, and this is where we are. Well, clearly the Calgary police need to read the report. They need to read the... Uh... Um, White Goose Flying Report, too, that speaks to our own city's response to this report. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And human That's... resources proving how they discriminate. Yeah. Oh, my God. I cannot believe they did that. Oh, I can believe it, but it's just, like you said, it's almost 2024, and we're still, you're still having to deal with this bullshit. Here we are. So looks like both Kat and Kathy got haircuts. You didn't? Okay. And what about you, Kathy? I, I don't know what that means. So I just assumed it was a yes, but uh, we'll go from there. Well, thanks, folks. I really appreciate, uh, re appreciate all your feedback and all your comments. And uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us for another year. I hope you might join us next year and uh, don't hesitate to uh, tell your friends, come join us. Maybe they can be a part of it. Um, I actually don't get much feedback from my podcast, even though I load them up. Very, very rare do people comment about what was in the podcast about uh, the book club. So I hope some folks from who do listen to my podcast would consider joining it as well, if for no other reason than to be in the same Zoom with uh, like a Sean Carlton. Sometimes when I'm lucky enough to get another author, hey. May I say deepest gratitude to you and all the energy you put into this book club, your podcast, your speeches, your activism, um, having patience with all of us white folk. <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. and. I see the work you do. And I'm Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kat. I appreciate that. All right. Anybody else want to say anything? Any other reflections? Uh, Kathy? 
Oh, I'm just, uh, I hate that when I can't remember, like, and then I start, I can't find that book where I know he put at least a few pages all in Cree. And he said, like, I'm not going to make it easy for you. If you want to know my story, you got to, you got to work for it. And that, you know, and I cannot find that book and it drives me crazy. <laughs> I keep thinking so it's love it language because I'm sure he was saying our language is love in in some capacity about that but i might be wrong yeah yeah it's gonna bug me now for the rest of the night <laughs> well if i get a text at two in the morning i'll totally understand <laughs> yeah well thank you for for the book club and and it is good to do things together because i'm trying to get through the uh the trc the final like the conclusion book by myself and yeah <laughs> it hasn't been touched for about three weeks now i read i don't know 75 pages and that's about all i got and so it would be a lot easier if i i think you were going through it you were almost done it when i first joined your book club at the library so i uh i kind of missed missed the boat with that one <laughs> Darn. So, i had yeah. debated going back and doing ones like that um i don't know but the, it's hard because there's so many great books that come out. And like even uh, Kat's book, Settler Book Club, she has great books. So it's so hard because I just want to read all the books. Just want to read all the books. There's not enough time. I just want to read all the books. <laughs> you can we have read to do only things. Indigenous books and you still would not get through everything. There's just so I much know. to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm grateful to do it with you all. So thank you folks for always being um, here, coming back and um yeah and get, and sharing your great thoughts on all of this because it helps us all so thank you all right well happy holidays i can't wait to see you in january and uh, i can't wait to see uh sean so please don't hesitate to think about questions you might want to ask about lessons in legitimacy and uh hopefully we can go from there oh i should say one other thing because tom flanagan was brought up I know Indigenous people who have done nothing in their academic career other than debunk every single piece of crap he's ever put out. And there was a fellow named Tony Hall. He was a part of my Idol No More experience. He was a prof down at the Lethbridge. Um, but he he had to leave because I think they can, considered him anti-Semitic. Um, anyway, he wrote a few books and I have a few of them. He gave he gifted them to me and I've been meaning to read them, but I haven't. But he, he talked about colonialism, settler colonialism. And whenever Tom Flanagan would testify for the crown with racist tropes, he would always be uh, the defense um, academic that would rebut whatever he said. So um, he tried to be a good ally to us, but uh, for his time. <laughs> mm. Anyway, all right, folks, and that's it for now. Happy holidays. I, I hope you have a wonderful holiday, whatever that might look for you. And um, yeah, take care, folks. <laughs>